Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship at Christus Lutheran. We'll, we'll begin with hymn 758, Let Children Hear. <laughs> sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I confess that I am sinful by nature, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. It is given he sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord by singing hymn 939. Oh, Lord, I'm Thank you. 
We pray. O Lord our God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Help us be ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the second chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with the 18th verse uh, in our Gospel reading. Jesus will be quoting some of these words. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the fields and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. These are the words of our God. We continue with the children's address. Hi, how are you today? Ah. Hi, you're with us today. Nice to see you. So, um, do you two that are going to Sunday school, do you two remember the Jesus Loves Me song? You do? Can you sing it, sing the first verse with me? Huh? Yes, you can. I'll sing it with you. How is that? Okay. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to me, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Okay. Not only the Bible tells you so, but your mom and dad tell you so. And you learn about it in Sunday school. So, um, who, do you, who do you believe in? Um, More specific. Jesus is God. Jesus, Jesus is God, by the way. Okay. We usually say, I believe in Jesus, because the Bible tells us to believe in Jesus to be saved. It does not say believe in God to be saved. It says believe in Jesus to be saved, because God sent Jesus to do what? Mm -hmm. so pay, so pay for our sins. Okay, how did, he, how did he pay for our sins? He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. You remember the creed, right? Okay, he was crucified. Um, and what what does it mean? Why did he? Why was he crucified? There was something that happened because he was crucified and died. You know what that meant? That's that means something really special for us. He died to pay for, our sins. pay for our sins. Very good. And that means we have forgiveness for our sins. And I don't know if you've learned the passage yet. I know you learn it in catechism because Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. So because Jesus rose on Easter morning, we live. Okay? Those are those are things that God wants us to teach all the little children 
there's a verse in the reading coming out. Jesus says to his disciples, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them, for he wants everyone to believe like a little child. Okay? A little child. So, even they've been taught that Jesus is our Savior from sin. Okay? We've learned that from when we were very, very young. Okay? And we say thank you to Jesus for, for being our Savior. Okay? Um, what we also learned in one of our, in our first song, first song that we sung this morning, God wants you to grow up and to be able to teach about Jesus to your children. He wants to go, you to go to a church that teaches their children about Jesus. Okay? Those are really important things. You are important not only to your parents or grandparents, you're important to all of us here. Because we all, in our own way, believe like little children. You know why? Because you've been taught about it, and you believe it. We've been taught about it, and we believe it. That is how our, even though we're adults, that's how even us, we believe like little children. Because God tells us so in the Bible. That's why we sang the song today. Okay, thank you. Our gospel lesson is rather interesting, and, and we could certainly apply what uh, I quoted to to them to the whole section. And that's what our sermon's going to be about. Our gospel is from Mark chapter 10, beginning with the second verse. Some Pharisees came and tested him, Jesus, by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw that, saw this, he was indignant. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of our Lord. We sing our next hymn, number 760, O Bless the House.
Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration is from Mark chapter 10, our gospel lesson. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the things I have done while I have aged, and I'm guessing many of you have done so as well, is to look back on one's life and to reflect. I think this is especially true once your children have grown and are out of the house. They start living their own lives apart from ours, and we sometimes see blatant differences from the way we once lived as a family. Honestly speaking, it is at those times that we sometimes see of see areas of parenting where we, looking back, would have done things different. Maybe if we had known how they had turned out, or maybe we were just not happy with what we did at the time. And again, honestly speaking, there are times where we look at the way our children live today, and we simply shake our heads in disbelief and say, that's not the way we taught them, and we wouldn't have changed a single thing. One of the things we do have to watch out for is being judgmental as we see others in the raising of their children. There aren't any of us, any of us, who were perfect parents, and you can find dozens of ways to, uh, that people tout as parenting skills and books in the library. I bet you, if you go to a bookstore, there's huge sections on it. There is no set way that works for everyone. Our children are different. Our situation in life is different. Where we live sometimes is different. Each family adjusts their parenting according to what is needed at the time. There is often a lot of parenting that is simply trial and error, and you go with the way that works. Today, we're going to look at a couple of different aspects of family life during our sermon, because Jesus covered a couple of different aspects, and see that Christ changes our relationships and that involving Jesus Christ and his desires for our marriage and family is always good. The truth from God's word that is going to set the tone for today's sermon is verse 15. That verse doesn't just set the tone for this sermon, it sets the tone for each and every time we hear God's word or when we read or study God's word. Let's listen to that verse once again. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. My wife and I have enjoyed seeing our grandchildren in various stages of life, from newborns, so there's a newborn that we baptized here last Christmas, and we have a grandson now in his second year of college. So we have all ages and we're, we're watching them all grow up. And I tell you, believe me, a strong-willed child who is going through their terrible twos is not what Jesus is talking about. 
but there are aspects from a two, three year old kids up here this morning. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. I think about, well, at the time I wrote this sermon, way back when, originally wrote it, I sort of redid a few things. But um, my, my daughter was teaching her children to pray. Praying before eating a meal, come Lord Jesus. Praying before going to sleep at night. <coughs> it's those calm teaching times, I think, that Jesus is talking about. And praying is one of the things Mary and I taught our two kids. When our children was young, they looked forward to their bedtime prayers. My wife had a routine with them that they really, really picked up on. They'd read together, and then they'd pray together before bed. I remember, or I, I prayed with them too, if I was in charge of life for the evening, but that was Mary's time with them, and she used that time well. My mom prayed with us before going to bed at night, and it was only when I grew up, when I sinfully said, I don't want to have to do this with my two sisters that were younger than me, that I got out of the habit. And it was a bad habit to have gotten out of. Just because I didn't want to be with my sisters. I grew past them. But praying with them was a good thing. Young children learn what they're taught. They pick up on things when they're made habit. Praying, going to worship, at Sunday school, going to church functions, fellowshipping with other church members. Children have, who have God as a regular part of their life learn about him, learn about Jesus and his love for them. They will freely tell you that Jesus is their Savior. It is that same Jesus who tells all of us adults that we must receive the kingdom of God like a little child. And that, my friends, goes against our sinful flesh. Our sinful flesh, and I got four things here. A, it doesn't like to be told how to believe. And B, this is the one that I rebelled against with the prayer thing. Our sinful flesh doesn't like to be told how to behave. Our sinful flesh wants to solve our own problems and not depend on someone else. Our sinful flesh wants to be in control of our own future and not have, not have it depend on the will of someone else, even God. First section of our sermon text dealt with marriage. <coughs> even concerning marriage, we are to have a childlike faith that trusts what God has said and makes it, that makes God's way their belief system. The Word of God said today, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. With a childlike faith, God expects us to follow his word. And with those words, we will see that God considers marriage to be a union. The two will become one flesh. 
between a male and a female. At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And we see that God also expects us not to separate that union until death, until he decides that our marriage comes to an end. With a childlike faith, many Christian husbands and wives have worked through some tough situations in their marriages because the two of them made a commitment to God that their marriage was to be for life. A second child, or a childlike faith considers God's will first and their own will second. We lose our childlike faith when we consider our will first and his will second, saying, well, that's not for me. And many people have said that. Many, many years ago, I remember hearing someone say, as they were contemplating divorce, God wants me to be happy. I would love to have someone show me the Bible passage which says we Christians have the right to break our marriage vows or to even cheat on our spouse if we're not happy. Well, I can, I can sin. God wants me to be happy. Any of you know a passage which says that? No. Actually, if we would consider marriage with a childlike faith concerning God's word, we wouldn't have to deal with so much divorce. That is because we Christian husbands, and I'm using, quoting from the Bible, we Christian husbands would be loving our wives as Christ loved the church. We wouldn't be selfish with our time, with our energy, with our desires. We would be loving our spouse as Christ loves the church. Totally unselfish. And because Christian wives would be submitting to their unselfish husbands who were looking to their wife's best interests as Christ loved the church and looking to their wife's needs as Christ loved the church. So it's a good thing when we have a childlike faith because then we'll be following what God wants. Now let's apply the childlike faith to the family. The childlike faith puts the needs of others on an equal footing with personal needs. The childlike faith allows a family of four, for example, not to be four individuals, but to be one family. The childlike faith puts God into the heart and core of family life, where his word, his will, and his worship comes first. There was an interesting thing I once learned from a Christian family counselor, and he recommended something for families based on God's Word. He says in God's Word, love is more important than law. That doesn't mean law isn't important, but there are times when love supersedes law. And the council recommends that parents teach through love, not law. I'll give you a couple examples. Don't make it a law that your child helps with the dishes. Rather, teach that love helps lessen the burden on the one who is making the meal. Don't make it a law that your child mows the lawn. Rather, teach that a family works together in taking care of the home and property, and you can help out dad and mom by doing this. That's an act of love. And you can apply this concept in many different aspects of family life, 
with the goal that we work together as a family unit doing the things we do for the good of everyone. We learn to show love for each other, sometimes in the little small ways that do really matter. We do these things because Christ makes our family relationships different from the other families of the world. The family unit is very important. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who said, a house divided against itself does not stand. And that's very true about family life as well. If even one member of the family is selfish and will not work for the good of the whole, it can literally destroy family unity. And honestly, one of the danger times in the family comes as our children go through high school. Why? Because they're becoming adults who hopefully soon will be able to stand on their own two feet to be able to go out and get jobs or go on to school to learn a vocation. Yet, we hope and expect that they, as newly confirmed Christians, realize their continued obligations toward God and family. As a church, we also must have a childlike faith which, see, which sees the needs of all. A six-year-old boy attending Sunday school should have his spiritual needs to be looked at as equal with men and women who are contributing hundreds or thousands of dollars to the church. The little child is equal to us adults in how we care for them in their, in their education. The disciples were not doing this. They were jealous of Jesus' time. You are here to teach us, not them, so they need to go. And wow, was Jesus upset. The Bible tells us that Jesus was <laughs> indignant with them for not caring about the needs of little children. I don't know about you, but I don't often use that word indignant. <laughs> I know what it means, but I... I rarely use it, and it's rarely used in the Bible. We might use the word outraged. Jesus, considering he is both true God and true man, could feel outrage. We are told that he was tempted in every way as we are. So for Jesus to feel outrage, he has to feel the same temptations that we do when we're outraged about something. You and I do feel that on occasion. However, the sin that comes when we let it get out of control, saying sinful words or committing a sinful action, because of our outrage, we give in to that Jesus did not. Jesus kept his outrage in control at all times, using his anger to forcefully teach his disciples that, first of all, children were just as important to him as they were, and that they, the disciples, needed to know how to live and learn and believe as little children live and learn and believe. And so our prayer today is that God the Holy Spirit come into each of our lives and give us, give each of us that childlike faith that Jesus <coughs> has spoken of this morning. Each of us does have that within us, that childlike faith. It takes a childlike faith to believe in Jesus as our Savior to believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins, like we heard in our children's sermon. It takes a childlike faith to believe it because we have no proof. 
We believe because we're told by the Bible, <coughs> by our Sunday school teachers, by our pastors, whoever they may be, we believe it because we were told. So now let's take that childlike faith one step further and use that childlike faith in our married lives, our family lives, and our church lives, literally our whole life under God. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us confess our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray the general prayer responsibly as it's printed on the bull in your bulletin or on the screen. We pray. Loving Father, your Son took the little children into his arms and blessed them. Help us to welcome little ones with joy. Be with all who are married. Guard the marriages that are struggling and help them not separate what you have joined together. Help all of us to show them. Be near to the families of our congregation. Help us all to see the value of being close to Jesus all our lives. Grant wisdom to all who govern us in this world and help them bring us peace, justice, and protection. We ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit for Pastor Bradley Pearson as he has considered our call to this congregation. Bless all who come today to the Holy Supper to receive our Lord Jesus. We also pray for the Beanek family. Uh, Tim's mother, Rita Pitchy, uh, passed away this week with the funeral being tomorrow. We pray, O oh Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you showed our fellow believer. Rita, now fallen asleep, we thank you for having brought her to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant to the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved. Through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Amen. And we also pray for all those who, who uh, were struck by the hurricane or the torrential rains that came from it. Um, there's so much damage. So many people have been displaced, and we ask the Lord's blessing for them. Dear Lord, we bow before you in this time of natural calamity. 
We confess that we as a nation have deserved your chastening judgments, yet we also trust your promises that even when you chase your, pur chasten, your purposes are loving and good. Be with your strong comfort among those most directly afflicted by the hurricane and in your mercy make shattered lives whole <coughs> once again. Use this tragedy to make us as a nation deeply aware of our total dependence on you. Give us courage to face whatever the future holds, knowing that it and we are in your hands. You hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We join to pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude with our final hymn, number 762. <laughs> section for announcements. So I had the privilege of talking to Pastor Pearson last night and he wanted me to give you every single assurance that it wasn't you, anything here that made him say no. But he didn't say exactly, but he mentioned two things. Uh, the, he, He's been there 20, 20 years or so. Uh, he lived in a par they lived in a parsonage for 14 years and they got a home about six years ago. So, you know, to all of a sudden have to sell that home that they made for themselves is a tough thing. Here's number two, and this might be the bigger one. They, 
the church in Prairie du Sac owned about seven and a half acres just on the outskirts of time, out of town, and they could not get what they needed to put a church out there. And just in the last few months, Prairie du Sac annexed the property, and now they can go forward with a building project, and they just in the last month or two put out the sign telling people this is going to be the future home of St. James. <laughs> so, yeah, I could, I could see him wanting to be there and, and uh, help them through that whole thing. Uh, so, uh, he just wanted me to tell you that you, to him you seem like an absolutely wonderful congregation of believers that he would really enjoy serving too. That's why it was a tough deliberation for him. So, I also have a thank you from Brenda Austin. I talked to her a couple days ago. She is doing okay. Um, she is not really even allowed to try to get around the house at this point yet. Soon, she said, and she hopes to be in church soon. Um, but she, she says, what a wonderful congregation of believers who have checked up on me, helped me with meals, and sent cards, and she, she says, I have seen that nowhere else in my life. And she just wanted me to tell you, tell in the congregation, thank you. Okay. Um, there is a note in there about Adopt the Highway, and that would be after church next Sunday. So if you are willing to help, please talk to Sarah Goodyear. And we're taking a special offering for um, the all the places that Hurricane Helene hit. Um, it's just unbelievable when you see some of the stories uh, that we've heard. So I went on the church on the synod's website um, to find out last night what's all happening. So <clears throat> we have uh, Christian Aid and Relief. They maybe even have a third now, but I don't know, but they have two fully stocked, full trailers, full of um, chainsaws, anything needed to help rebuild, um, to clean up. Uh, and they can go wherever they're needed. And um, they had some members of the committee in the Asheville <coughs> area yesterday. So they, they will be making a report. So I'm going to read to you two, two quick articles just to tell you about what's going on. Um, so Hurricane Helene rode ashore on September 26, bringing a swath of destruction from the Big Bend region of Florida all the way to the southern Appalachians. Uh, the death toll is 200 plus now. Uh, they've been in contact with district leaders and pastors in the impacted areas to find out their needs. None of the churches experienced major damage and none of our members lost their lives. However, many experienced extensive damages to their properties, some lost their homes entirely. Many of our brothers and sisters are in need. He's working with pastors. Um, Get there, going out to see where they're needed. Uh, many of you have asked how you could help. Um, my wife and I uh, gave, we, you could, they have a place. If you bring up wells.net on your computer and the first, you know, you just scroll a teeny bit and you see the Christian aid and relief efforts and you click on that and you go right to the page which gives you another link where you could donate. So you can donate that way, or you can donate through our congregation. Um, and this one's from South Atlantic District President Charles Westra. 
and he thanks everyone for praying for their brothers and sisters. Um, he says, many congregations celebrated Michael and all angels because they protected him. <laughs> um, Pastor Paul Zell in Henderson, North Carolina, shared that the communication has been very difficult because self-service is spotty at best. He's spoken to most of his members and all are safe, but there are many in the greater Asheville area that are still missing. Widespread flooding and mudslides were a severe threat. Many members suffered significant damages to home and property. Um, Pastor Jonathan Newman in Martinez, Georgia told me that they are, they are in day five without power. A shortage of drinking water is a problem for many. Extensive cleanup is needed on the church property. Many members have suffered significant damage to homes and pro property, and aid and relief will be there this week. Pastor David Preeby shared that six families in Bay Pines, Florida have been displaced from their homes on the barrier islands due to storm surge. Most of the damage was confined to the narrow strip of Panayas County along the beach. Three families from Living Savior in Valparico, Florida also suffered uh, significant damage to their homes. Two families from Peace and Trinity, Florida lost all the contents of their homes. And from watching the Weather Channel, less than 20% of these people had flood insurance because they were nowhere near where they ever thought a flood would come. And so when they lose all their stuff, it's lost. And so Christian Aid and Relief can help uh, with, with all that through, they, they work through the pastors and the congregation. So if you are able to help, uh, we have a collection plate back there by the church steps uh, you can do that way or you can go online and donate that way we won't measure our congregation by what's in the plate um, we'll measure it by our hearts and, and the giving in whatever way you can anyway uh, god's blessings to all of you come and enjoy a good meal today well, uh, i think the sunday sunday school is going to meet real quick uh, maybe have a little devotion and, and the story, and then join us. Have a, see you. See you back. <laughs>